we get started. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to um, our next to last session um, of NBK's um, Rose Brooklyn's Night School. Um, we've been having um, these um, events every other Monday um, for the past year or so, I believe. Um, and we've been covering, we started out for semester kind of covering what is democratic socialism, kind of the basics of socialism. And um, this semester and the next upcoming one, we're kind of doing uh, deeper dives um, into um, just some other topics of political education. And today we're kind of, we're going to be talking about um, imperialism and foreign policy. Um, and so the reason we had do and became like these night schools and political education events is because we want to be informed. We want to um, learn about, you know, we want to learn about things in order to work towards changing them and um, become better socialists. So that's like a big to inspire some of you to organize if, if you're not in DSA to join DSA. Um, so yeah. So today we're gonna be, we have our guest, um, Vincent Bevins. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, um, for the LA Times um, and previously worked um, in London for the Financial Times. Um, in 2017, he moved to Jakarta and, became, and began covering Southeast Asia for the Washington Post. Um, so he's the author of the Jakarta Method, um, which was uh, published uh, last year, I believe, um, which is about CIA interventions um, in global conflicts. Um, so again, thank you, uh, Vincent, for being here. Um, do you, uh, Carrington and Mia, do you want me to kind of talk about how it's going to go, like the structure? So we're just... Um, it's okay. Yeah. So Vincent's just going to say a few, uh, he's going to speak for maybe 25 minutes and then we will go to a Q&A probably for the rest of the evening. So thank you. Great. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Well, thank you so much for the introduction and for the um, invitation. Yeah. I'll try to talk about the book itself and its relevance sort of to the current moment and to the topics of imperialism and foreign policy for a bit. Uh, you'll have to forgive me uh, a little bit because it's it's 1 a.m. where I am I, uh, and the internet might not be great. I am, um, I can't even say where I am actually, but I'm not in a, a rich country, uh, the, which means the internet could drop. Um, and that uh, could even be a way to link to the topic of the sort of the book and the talk because really in, in, in a sense, the book is about the gap between the rich world and the rest of the world, the, between the global north and the global south, the first world and the third world, as they used to be called. Um, and like this particular moment, it's a little easier to feel what that divide means than I think it usually is for a lot of us that are from the first world. I mean, I'm from LA um, because of the pandemic, right? So uh, this is a moment where if you are in the global north, you probably have had a vaccine or know somebody that did. If you are not from a rich country, you're from a normal country, that's not true at all. Um, and usually this sort of the gap between the global north and the global south is sort of obscured. It's hard to actually get a sense of like what that means um, in a concrete sense, unless you like go try to like work in a mine in uh, East Africa for a couple of days and get a sense of how, how different life can really be. Um, but now like, it's just really obvious in this brief moment, like the pandemic freaked out the elites enough that they just kind of didn't try to hide this one. They're like, yeah, we're gonna keep all the vaccines for the for the rich countries, even though that's not best the best thing for humanity or even for protecting the health of rich people. Um, so uh, the book though, um, the book is about anti-communist mass murder. Um, it is about the intentional extermination of innocent civilians for being leftist or for being accused of being leftist in the 20th century. Um, and the central event in the story, no, not the first, not the first chapter in the story, is the intentional, uh, is, the, is the murder of approximately 1 million civilians in 1965 in Indonesia. Like, so I said, this is the apex of the story, it doesn't start there, but this is a moment that really changes the course of the Cold War. Um, in my opinion, it might've been the most important victory for the United States in the Cold War. Um, 
and it was so successful um, in uh, according to the horrible logic of the men that were running the Cold War for the West, um, uh, that it was copied in other places around the world. And Jakarta was often the name that was given to these copycat programs, not always. Um, and I found then that in at least 22 countries in the 20th century, regimes allied with the United States, supported by the United States, employed the intentional mass murder of leftist civilians, justified on anti-communist ideological grounds, in the construction of a particular type of authoritarian capitalist regime that has become incredibly familiar to those people that live in the global south. And I think that this process, this tactic, this method was incredibly important in shaping the type of globalization that we got uh, after the end of the Cold War and, and therefore the world that we live in now. Um, so that's what it's really about. But to tell that story, whether in book talks or on podcasts or in, in, the, in the book itself, I always like to start with the division of the world, uh, the division of the planet rather, into three worlds, first world, second world, and third world after the end of World War II. Because although that, um, that nomenclature has fallen out of favor, largely because in the English language, at least, largely because of the racism of many speakers of the English language, um, I think it's really useful for, for getting at where we were at the end of World War II and what was expected to happen and what happened instead. So at the end of World War II, the United States, um, a, uh, uh, a Western European settler colony in North America emerged as by far the most powerful country in history. Um, and, and the first world was led by the United States, but also included the formerly um, imperialist uh, countries of uh, Western Europe and Japan and Australia. So all countries that had either engaged in formal imperialism, uh, including the United States, or were still fighting to keep hold of their colonial possessions in places like Africa and Asia. Then there was a the second world, which was led by Moscow. This was the other winner of World War II. Um, they emerged um, also as a world power, but this is important to remember, much, much weaker than the United States in every single way, economically, militarily, they were devastated compared to the West. They had no interest in declaring war on the West. They were very afraid uh, of the, the way the, the West might react to any provocation. Uh, and But um, they were certainly in, enforcing uh, a large degree of influence, especially in Central Europe, um, uh, um, with Stalin in charge back in Moscow. And then there was a third world, and that is the vast majority of humanity. These were all of the peoples um, that had lived under direct and formal colonial control uh, for the last hundreds of years. So Africa, Asia, Latin America, this is about two thirds um, of the world's people. And as I said, the racism of certain English speakers have degra has degraded the, the term third world uh, in the decades since, but at the time it was not a derogatory term whatsoever. It was an entirely optimistic, forward-looking name for a conscious political project. The idea of the third world was that these countries would come together after achieving formal independence from Western Europe or the United States um, and take their rightful place on the world stage alongside the rich white countries that had um, enslaved or exploited them for hundreds of years and alongside this new upstart um, uh, regime in Moscow, which had taken so much control of Europe, uh, well, of Eurasia rather, uh, in World War II. Um, and this, again, it, I want to stress, it was seen as very obvious for the leaders of the third world, this nascent um, intentional movement, that since they got their independence from Europe, since that the rule of the French in Vietnam or the Dutch in Indonesia and so on was going to end, that this would unleash this latent power of humanity, which would, of course, be able to catch up with the other countries. Once the shackles of formal colonialism were gone, they would build their own uh, world. They would build their own, they would reshape the global conditions uh, that, uh, 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 of production, reshape the global economy, but also create national um, environments that were suited to their own cultures, to their own um, uh, desires. And this almost ex always at the time meant socialism, some rejection of capitalism. The, 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 there was an almost automatic um, association between anti-colonialism and socialism 
uh, in the first half of the 20th century. So how does the first world led by the United States interact with this scenario, right? So the, the United States was, was rather new, new to this, right? They had not had centuries of experience like the British um, with spies around the world controlling empires. Um, they weren't supposed to be an empire. They did not have MI6. But in the first um, world years after World War II, the United States founded the Central Intelligence Agency whose formal uh, um, job was to collect information around the world, but also was engaged in covert operations to change history, to, to engineer outcomes um, wherever they could. Now, they tried to take on the second world and they failed over and over and over. Um, their, their job was to take on Moscow and the areas directly controlled by the Red Army. They just couldn't get anywhere. They, they, they were sending men to their death um, repeatedly. Uh, and they turned their energies to the third world, which even the most sympathetic historians of the CIA admit they didn't really understand uh, at all. Um, so they really got going. This started to work out quickly for the United States. Uh, in 1953, 1954, the CIA racks up its first successes um, in the third world. That is overthrowing democracy in Iran in 1953 and then Guatemala in 1954 and then installing pro-American authoritarian capitalist regimes, right? And this was seen as, uh, wow, uh, we've cracked the code. Uh, President Eisenhower and the guys uh, from, CIA, from the CIA were incredibly proud of what they had done. They thought that they could avoid war um, like they had had in Korea and engineer pro-American outcomes in the post-colonial world with very little effort uh, and um, without really anybody knowing they did it. Everybody else, actually everybody in the world knew it, that they were doing it. Everybody in Guatemala and Iran knew it and everybody in the global and robust left-wing press, which is another thing we've lost since then, um, knew exactly what had actually happened in Iran and Guatemala. But to the boys in Washington, DC, this was, this was magic. So um, it's at that point I want to turn to Indonesia because in that year, 1955, is when the United States changes the way that it thinks about a man named Sukarno, who's the first president of what is now the fourth largest nation in the world by population, and who had really forged the identity of Indonesian-ness out of the anti-colonial, socialist, nationally, nationally proud struggle. It, you know, nationalism was a word, but it's very different than the kind of nationalism we had in Europe. It was, it was an anti-colonial um, identity that brought together this Muslim majority nation, the other religions, uh, uh, anti-colonial forces, the Communist Party, um, Muslim forces, and the military uh, to, to create what came to be Indonesian-ness. And up until 1955, the United States thought maybe this was somebody that they could deal with. This was maybe fine. Um, this type of third world nationalism was seen as suspect but acceptable, um, especially because right-leaning forces in the military had put down a small uh, communist bid for um, control over the, uh, the war to expel the Dutch's attempt to reconquer the country from 1945 to 1949. So the United States thought, okay, this is not exactly what we want, but it's not close enough to communism that we need to crush it. This changed in 1955, uh, as I said, uh, for two reasons. One, President Sukarno, organized the Bandung Conference, which as he put it in a very famous opening speech was the first time in human history that the world's colored peoples came together without the oversight of white peoples. So the, the Afro-Asian Con Conference in 1955 in Bandung was really the formal birth of the third world movement. Um, it represented a huge chunk of humanity coming together again along anti-colonial lines with this project of working together to build a new world in which um, the post-colonial nations had, had a right to shape the global order. The United States did not like this one bit. Um, they responded to it with racist uh, condescension and shock and horror. Um, and then also in 1955, the Indonesian Communist Party, which I mentioned briefly before, um, did very well in elections, much better than, than, than previously. So, so their participation in a young, complicated and, and chaotic, uh, but democratic parliamentary system 
um, was getting better and better. Now, the thing about the Indonesian Communist Party is that they were the oldest party in Asia um, to be founded as a communist party, founded before the Chinese Communist Party. And it was very old school in many of its outlooks. It was um, by any, uh, you know, compared to what the average English speaker thinks of when they hear the word communist today, they were incredibly moderate. Um, they believed in forging an alliance with the national bourgeoisie to build capitalism along national lines, anti-colonial lines. And then much later, like 50 years later, think about a transition to socialism. Um, they had no armed wing. They had no theory of armed struggle. They had no, um, they had no discussions of ever violently seizing power. They wanted to do better and better in elections and they were doing better and better elections. Uh, and even declassified uh, CIA MI6 files admit the reason they were doing so much better in elections than everybody else is because they were the best party. They were the best at organizing. Uh, they were the least corrupt. They would go out and change people's lives. They seemed to mean what they were saying. And this is really what scared <laughs> the CIA and MI6 is that they were really winning. Um, so in 1955, they launched the first of three attempts to crush the Indonesian left and Sukarno's vision of Indonesia. Um, the first thing they try is to simply funnel money to a conservative Muslim party. This is a, a, a standard trick the CIA had developed initially in Italy uh, in the first elections after World War II. Just give loads of money to the center right or the far right, any party that can win. Uh, hopefully that will stop them. Uh, that did not stop them. They kept winning more and more elections. In 1958, the CIA bombed the country. They um, fomented and then supported regional rebellions um, and then participated in these rebellions, dropping bombs, American pilots, uh, dropping bombs on this archipelago nation, killing civilians um, in what was at that point, the largest CIA operation uh, ever. Um, it was based to some extent on the Guatemala success. They thought they would easily reproduce what they had done in Guatemala. It just, it didn't work. Um, one of the reasons it didn't work is that an American uh, pilot named Alan Pope crash landed into the island of Ambon, a tiny little island in the northeast uh, of the country, and he was caught. Uh, so the Indonesian left, which had been saying for a very long time, I think the Americans aren't going to let us have democracy. I think they're going to try to crush us, to break apart the country, to kill us, do whatever it takes to make sure that we don't stand up on our own two feet and shape the future of our country in the way we want, they were proved right in a very obvious way. Alan Pope was all over the news uh, as a captured American pilot who had been killing Indonesians. So the US retreats for a while. Um, they switch from taking on the Indonesian military directly to flying thousands of them to Kansas to train at Fort Leavenworth. And in Kansas, um, they learned a lot of things, but, but one of the main things they learned was basically essentially the American ideology. The, you know, they, learned to, they learned what Americans wanted, the role that Americans thought that they could play in, in shaping the future of Indonesia. Uh, and they learned what it would take to get the support for that, for that kind of an in, for an endeavor. So this training happens between 1958 and 1964. And then in, 19, in, 19, in 1964, after John F. Kennedy is killed, which really does change the, 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 the direction of the story, um, Lyndon Johnson takes over, um, very upset with a fight that Sukarno has picked with Malaysia and the British over the way that they had been redrawing the map of that formerly British uh, territory. Um, and instead of working with Indonesia, they, they, they pull out the ambassador and they begin agitating behind the scenes, CIA and MI6, to create a clash between the very well-armed Indonesian military and the entirely unarmed, but popular Indonesian Communist Party, knowing very well what happens when an armed and an unarmed group clash. Now, the last talk I gave to DSA, I, I mentioned this is probably the largest democratic socialist organization in human history. So at this point, the Indonesian Communist Party had about 20% of the nation either a card carrying member or in one of the affiliate associations and CIA MI6 um, uh, reckoned that about a third of the country would have voted for the PKI, Indonesian Communist Party, giving them victory in an election if it were to happen. But instead, 
what happened was this clash um, engineered um, for which the CIA and, and MI6 had been agitating in ways we still don't understand did happen. And when this clash did happen, a general Suharto used the confusion, used the, 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 the momentary chaos to seize power, jumping rank and establish dictatorial control over Indonesia, over the head of Sukarno. Um, and he shut down all of the information uh, sources in the country that he did not control and began to spread with the help of the United States, BBC, Radio Australia, um, and many other Western outlets. This horrible, ridiculous, grotesque story about a communist plot to take over the country and that the feminist wing of the Indonesian Communist Party at the time, one of the largest feminist organizations in the world, had taken six heroic generals out to some horrible Marxist torture dungeon uh, and performed a tantric, sexual, satanic murder torture ritual, ritual on them, um, cutting off their genitals and then throwing them in a well. And then the Sukar uh, Suharto, now controlling all the communications in the country, spread the story that the Communist Party was guilty of this, was trying to co commit atrocities, and they had to be taken care of before they would do this. So this propaganda story was used over the next few months to round up um, at least 1 million, perhaps 2 million leftists and accused leftists. Um, these were many of, the, these, many of these people I got to know over the last three or four years. Um, people that were in a party that they believed to be totally legal and normal, like it was the kind of thing your teacher would, would be in. And then you would get into it too, if you wanted to be a teacher, if you wanted to be a musician, it was just, it was like, join, it was like joining the Democratic Party if you're from New York, really. Um, not even as, 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 not nearly as underground as the DSA. And um, they were taken in to police stations or military bases and, and thought they were being held in jail until one by one at night, some of them were taken out and never returned. Uh, and what happened is that approximately 1 million were killed, not in an open and public way, but they were disappeared. Um, and, and what this means, I mean, I think you know what it means literally, but what it means psychologically is that all the people in the, in the lives of these victims that could resist, that might mount some kind of a, a, a counterattack on this nascent dictatorship are frozen with fear because everybody by human nature will think, well, I know that a lot of people have, are dead, but my son or my brother or my wife is, is probably still alive. I, I shouldn't do anything because if I, if I do something, that could be what gets them killed. Um, and this is incredibly effective um, for the budding Suharto dictatorship. The United States, every step of the way during the mass killing, gets information about what's going on, encourages the, the further killings, making it very clear that the aid that the military so badly needs will be dependent upon what is clearly uh, a mass murder operation. Uh, in one case, uh, we have uh, just somebody admitting from the, the embassy staff um, that they gave lists of people that needed to be murdered to the Indonesian military. And then they would wait to get the list back with the names checked off. And he was, he was, not, he was not ashamed about this at all. He, was, he gave an interview to the Washington Post and just said, yes, I have a lot of blood on my hands, but, but so what? Um, and then what you get as a result of this violence, again, this is another important thing about the Cold War. This violence didn't happen because some dictator w went mad and no one could rein him in. It was as a result of this mass murder that he was able to forge a government which became one of the most important allies of the United States in the Cold War. And overnight, Indonesia went from one of the most vocal anti-colonial, anti-imperial, left-leaning but not communist forces in, in global history to one of the most compliant, quiet, easy friends of the United States in history. Now, a million other people stayed in concentration camps where they were starved and tortured for a decade as the United States um, sent dollars pouring into the country and as US corporations, um, uh, all of the familiar names, exactly who you think, uh, 
uh, rushed into air conditioned uh, business conferences to, to discuss uh, the future of Indonesian capitalism. And this was seen as a huge success. Again, this was a very important country. This was seen in the early 60s as a more important victory uh, or more important prize, I should say, than Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam is a much smaller country. Vietnam is, 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 is not leading the third world uh, movement. Uh, Indonesia is not presenting a model around the world of how a mix of nationalism and religion uh, and democracy can deliver uh, social justice and independence. Uh, this was a huge deal for the United States. Um, and though we've largely forgotten about this, this swing in the Cold War, uh, in the English speaking world, at least uh, to this day, everybody else in the Cold War at the time was really paying attention. Um, and on the left, the lesson that was learned by many people around the world very quickly was, there is no peaceful path to socialism. The United States is going to come for you, at least in the conditions of post-coloniality, given American hegemony, you must be tightly organized, self-defensive, uh, and you must have a plan for the inevitable counterattack. Um, now, Cuba, uh, and I don't want to get too far off topic, but Cuba was already informed by this logic because Che Guevara had been in Guatemala in 1954 during the coup. He had seen what had happened to the communists there who were murdered at the behest of the United States government after the successful uh, regime change operation. And he came to a conclusion as a result of that, well, you have to be self-defensive. You have, you know, to use the word dictatorial if you like, you have to be ready. And they were ready for the Bay of Pigs in 1961. Um, so that lesson was learned often with tragic consequences by the left around the world. Pol Pot said that this is what set him on the path that he took after uh, 1965. The, the Cultural Revolution in China was largely informed by, not largely informed, uh, in the Cultural Revolution, the story of the Indonesian massacre uh, 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 featured very largely in, in propaganda about what the Cultural Revolution was about. Um, the Philippine Communist Party, I interviewed uh, its founder, he's still uh, uh, very active. Um, he said that he took an armed Maoist approach as a result of the massacre in Indonesia. Um, so that was what the left learned. Now, what did the right learn? What did global anti-communist forces, allies of the United States, potential allies of the United States, what did they learn? Well, they learned, oh, we could do this, right? Not only does it work to round up potential opponents to the regime we want to create and murder them, the United States will help us and then let us get, like, help us to get away with it. Not only we will, get, will we get the support of the most powerful country in history to do this, they will help launder our reputation afterwards and we will be accepted with open arms into the quote unquote free world. So that brings me to Chile in 1970 when Salvador Allende is elected uh, democratically as socialist uh, uh, um, leader of that country. Now, the narrative you sometimes hear uh, in the English speaking world about Allende is that, oh, he messed up and then there was a reaction. Well, terrorism actually started against the Allende administration before he even took office. The CIA began operations which ended up in the death of the head of the, the, the Indonesian military before he even took office. The reason for this was the head of the military was opposed to a coup. Um, the plan was to kidnap him, um, pretend the left had done it, and then use that to justify taking power from Miami before he even took office, but it didn't work. They were, they were caught. Um, something that I think might have been inspired by Jakarta in 1965 was, 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 was aborted. But in 1972, as part of a terror campaign that took many forms in, in, in Santiago and around the nation, some people probably hired by US uh, funded uh, right-wing terrorist organizations began to paint Jakarta is coming on the walls of Santiago. And to anybody that knew the story of the Cold War at the time, uh, up until that point, it was very clear what that meant. It meant we're going to kill you like the Indonesians killed their communists. And in 1973, this is precisely what happens. Um, Pinochet takes over uh, after the CIA succeeds finally in overthrowing Allende, And Jakarta, Jakarta does come. Um, thousands of people are murdered by the, the young Pinochet regime. Then in 1975, Pinochet and other countries in uh, South America get together to form Operation Condor, which is a cross-border mass murder network, which allows them to 
uh, allowed these uh, authoritarian capitalist regimes to eliminate the um, their enemies or perceived enemies, uh, no matter where they were. So you could kill somebody that fled across the border to Argentina or into Peru, or they were active in Europe. They killed somebody in Washington D.C. They killed two people in Washington D.C. Um, uh, and the, this, the member country, uh, excuse me, the member countries of Operation Condor killed tens of thousands of people in the 70s. And then in the 80s, Central America becomes the perceived problem spot for the growing project of American led capitalist hegemony. Um, and in Guatemala and El Salvador, especially, hundreds of thousands of people are killed for being communist or suspected of being communist or for being from the indigenous ethnicity, which is associated with people that are too sympathetic to communism. Um, and this was done in collaboration with both the Condor nations and the United States uh, that provided training. So as I said, by the end of the Cold War, you have huge chunks of the world, much of South America, much of Southeast Asia, parts of Africa that got on their current path to development through the mass murder of perceived enemies to an authoritarian capitalist regime, through the murder of leftists. Not that the murder of leftists happened also, that the murder of leftists made possible and shaped the order that they inherited. Um, and this is obvious in the case of those 22 countries, but I argue that there's really an effect on the entire shape of globalization that, 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 that we get at the end of um, the Cold War when the Soviet Union collapses uh, largely uh, because it commits suicide on accident. Um, and um, one really simple way to sum this up, because I want to wrap up and get to questions, is that the Third World Movement was crushed with among other things, the use of mass murder of those that were questioning America's version of globalization, of post-colonial reality. And even, an even simpler way to put it is that the Cold War was not between the first and the second world, it was before, between the first and the third world, with the first world aggressing the third world. That, um, that uh, the third world uh, tried to decolonize in a way which would be robust and allow for full, um, the full enjoyment of rights on, uh, 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 um, as equals with the first world. And the first world used, among other things, mass murder to stop real or robust decolonization from happening. Um, and the people that I met over the course of this work, the people that, that I knew, that, I, that told me what they believed back in the 60s about what they thought the world would be like now, would call the current order a neo-colonial order, one in which there's not formal control, but in which largely the, the material relationship between the first and third world is the same as it was um, in 1945. Um, and a lot of the people that I met, um, I mean, I don't, I don't wanna be, I don't wanna draw too many lessons from this because I don't know, <laughs> but a lot of the people that I met and whose friends were, were killed had believed passionately for most of the 20th century in the moderate nonviolent path. Um, but they ended up telling me um, very unhappily that those that took the more self-defensive and organized route, those that took the armed path or those that, those that trusted the Americans least were proved right. Um, so that's where, that's where we are now. But with this line, I think very obviously still here um, between the countries that are getting vaccinated and those that are not at all, uh, rich countries not even to pretending to really that they need to give an explanation for this. Um, you know, gaps in in wealth between in between countries that are at extraordinary levels, um, and and this legacy, which I think that it can be a source of sort of inspiration that is in very in many ways really heroic and um, can can give energy to a new generation that's growing up and sort of discovering the traditions that exist, but is also quite difficult to, to, to digest and to, um, it's really hard to know what to do with it. Um, so with that, I'll say thank you so much again for, for inviting me and, and uh, I guess move to the, the questions portion. 
Um, thank you so much, uh, Vincent. I know that we have a lot of questions for you, but first, um, Obi is going to present the, our community agreement just so we can all, um, you know, interact nicely. Obi. Thanks, Carrington, and uh, thank you, Vincent, for the great and informative talk. Um, I would like to remind everybody that we're all here to learn, and uh, please assume good intentions and be comradely uh, as much as possible. Um, if you have a question, please write stack in the chat. Um, and as soon as you're there, we'll call on you. And once you're asking your question, please be brief. Uh, keep it under 30 seconds. And, and as much as possible, keep uh, anecdotes and qualifications out at, if you can. And if, uh, if the question is long, just write, your, just write stack again and we'll come back to you. Thank you. Um, thanks, Obi. And then Ashley is going to um, oversee the Q and A, uh, and uh, it's all yours, Ashley. Yeah. So everyone, as Obi just uh, mentioned, if you have any questions, please put stack in the comment section. I'll try to prioritize and marginalize voices as best I can. Um, so we're going to kick it off now. So let's start with Carrington. Yay. Uh, you know, I have a question. It's a little bit granular, but um, uh, you talk about uh, Sicano's government turning to guided democracy, but I, I don't remember in the book you think why he does that, except that the PKI, the Indonesian Communist Party, was just increasingly popular with every election. Um, just wondering if there were like pressures or other motivations for him to do this and what role this played in Sicano's ultimate downfall. Um, you know, if there hadn't been a guided democracy, would things have looked different? Yeah, it's a good question. So guided democracy, to explain, is Sukarno's quasi-authoritarian turn um, after the CIA um, bombing campaign. So like a state of emergency is declared after the CIA um, kills these civilians. Uh, and he moves to this idea. I mean, it's partially his ideas and it's partially him trying to deal with a very chaotic um, set of forces underneath him that he tries to sort of fix with himself as like the charismatic populist leader. Um, uh, the, the democracy had become, well, it didn't really become untenable. He thought it had become untenable. Uh, the military wanted more power than they were going to get, get through the ballot box, that the Communist Party was going to get more power through the ballot box than was going to be tenable given the geopolitical situation and the strength of the military. State of emergency was declared, and he moved to the system where essentially he ended up uh, sitting above the two main forces in the country. Um, and no, sorry, I, I some, he also expelled the, the parties that had sided with the CIA in the Civil War. So Absolutely, the CIA invasion was part of the reason they, there was this authoritarian turn. I mean, you see this all the time in the 20th century. After a country's attacked, they sort of, they, they, they go into bunker mentality. But it was also partially Sukarno's personality. He thought that Western uh, uh, liberalism was un-Indonesian, and he thought that there was a way to create this sort of new system in which the forces would interact with each other. But what it really was, was him above the Communist Party, and the military playing them against each other, trying to maintain this delicate balance. Um, all the while, the material and concrete balance of forces were shifting in favor of the military, even as in terms of popularity with the people, the PKI was doing better and better and better. So you have this very strange situation where the PKI had more support than ever, but less ability to do anything about it. And the military had more guns and training in support of the American, Americans than ever. Um, but they didn't have any mass based radiology. They just had sort of power. Um, and then there was, so that's where you get this remarkable turn using this very well crafted propaganda story. I assume not, not crafted by Suharto in 1965, but yeah, like would things have been gone different if that turn didn't happen? Absolutely. What I, I like to go back and if I want to run like a counterfactual, I go, well, what would have happened if the CIA didn't start just in, interfering back in 1955? What if you would have let actual democracy flourish in the way that it was allowed to flourish in an imperfect way in countries like France and Italy where the Communist Party just existed, um, doing fairly well, influencing uh, 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 policy, losing votes when they didn't do well. You know, uh, that's, that's where I like to go back to, to ask that question. But um, 
absolutely things changed because of the shift to, to democracy. It was, it was not a long-term tenable system, especially given the, the balance of forces. Next thank you. Uh, Eva? Hi. Um, so yeah, thank you again. Um, I guess I was just kind of wondering, you know, through your research, um, obviously like this was a, you know, um, a reaction to communist forces, but I guess I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on the connection between um, capitalism and imperialism. Yeah, so I mean, Imperialism, as the Communist Party of Indonesia understood, it would have been informed by Lenin's uh, idea that um, essentially after uh, uh, a certain point in history, uh, the, the country, you know, capitalist enterprises have to go out into the rest of the world and find markets. But like, if you talk about, if you try to explain US foreign policy in the 20th century, um, using liberal terms, you kind of get the same answer anyways, which is that um, the simplest way for me to put it is that U.S. Uh, foreign policy officials from 1945 to 2000 were uh, motivated by two things. Geopolitics, so like their understanding of where they were going to be influential and where they could put bases and where communists weren't going to be and to where they could fight their ideological enemies and the influence of big companies on their decision making. So they were very off, very, very often in close collaboration with companies um, that had very specific interests in certain parts of the world where like, oh yeah, this is a place we want to go and um, extract natural resources uh, and then sell things and sell things back to the people, right? So in the case of Indonesia, oil was very important. Oil is always important. Like it's kind of boring, but it's everywhere uh, in, in 20th century uh, foreign policy. Um, and the, again, yeah, again, the leftist conception in like what sort of everybody in liberal accounts of, of, of 20th century history say is kind of the same. Like you can look at the way that lobbying works and the, the, the nexus in DC and these big companies basically say, oh, well, Guatemala is going to, is going to pass a land reform, which is going to be very badly uh, affect the business interests of United Fruit. I'm United Fruit. I'm friends with this this guy in in Washington D.C. Um, he his job, in at some sense, as the government of the United States, is to make business flourish for the companies that he runs. So, um, I think that these two these two elements interact all the time. There's there's debates when you talk about specific acts um, of intervention. Like, was was it more anti-communism? In geopolitics or was it more like naked economic interest and i say that like usually both are present some more some are some another but if you really want to make sure that the united states is going to come and overthrow your country you should threaten the profits of a major american firm and also threaten their perceived hegemony in your part of the world um next we're gonna go for jeremy Hey, thank you so much for the talk. Um, this question may be sort of answered by the nature of the talk itself, but uh, uh, I'm curious, you know, one thing that occurred to me reading this is just like how, um, how little most Americans know about the foreign policy of this country and how, you know, I think there's a decent reason to think like how little Americans in general, certainly working class Americans would approve of this country's foreign policy if they knew it. Um, I wonder how, in what ways, given especially, you know, that you mentioned in the book, like that there are still things we don't know, like how secretive a lot of this stuff is, what ways are there to educate popularly, to just get people to be kind of confronted? I mean, maybe we all just need to be Noam Chomsky, um, because I guess this is sort of what he spent his life doing, but just like you know, raising popular consciousness, spreading awareness and information about the U.S.'s um, murderous foreign policy commitments? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good and tough question, right? Because unlike things like, you know, Medicare for all or uh, uh, a, 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 a union fight in this or that country, in this, this or that state, you, if people don't know about this stuff, they just don't know about it 
right? And so that's the whole point of the covert operations of, of, of the CIA in the first place. Um, and there was real, really a lot of lying to the American people uh, via the, 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 the media, which was very, um, saw it as its role to lie on behalf of the government. But if you just didn't, if they didn't know, they just didn't know. And to get Americans to know and deeply care about what's happening in 180 countries, because that's how many countries we're active in right now, is really hard. And for me, it just seems like there's a contradiction between empire and democracy. Because in a democracy, a regular person needs to pay the bills, they need to take care of their family, they need to pay attention to the issues that are affecting them in their daily lives. That takes up a lot of time. How do you expect a regular voter to also keep up on the ways in which uh, an imperial power is uh, 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 um, acting in 180 countries around the world? It's very hard to do. Now, a really robust press that really sort of always was able to figure out what's happening and then was honest about the worst things that are happening um, as a result of US foreign policy, I guess would help. Um, I guess trying to always be cognizant of the fact that anti-imperialism doesn't come naturally. You have to sort of really remember to think about foreign policy all the time. I think that's just like a good lesson, whether or not you're like a mainstream journalist or you're uh, uh, the member of a left-wing party, just to be like, this is always there. Um, it's, it, it is possible to forget it, so just don't. Um, but again, I don't know, uh, like it hasn't worked in the history of the in the history of the United States, there has never been a moment when uh, a significant portion of the American population knows or cares about this stuff. So obviously, no one's really cracked the code. But I, I think um, we, we really shouldn't give up. Um, I'm going to put myself on stack um, real quick. I'm curious in your experience. Um, you know, doing this work, and I assume talking to people about it. Are there any, you know, strategies, communication approaches for people who just will not believe you when you tell them these things? Because I know I've had that experience personally with my family, and they're just like, how do you know this is true? And you have to explain to them how investigative journalism and like historians work. So what has your um, experience been with that? Yeah, no, this is, I mean, this is, there's a really perverse, like, I mean, I, I think probably a lot of people come across this. If you just sort of say like, the basic unquestioned truth about US foreign policy in the 20th century, you sound like a conspiracy theorist. Like if you, like if you can just say like what is absolutely agreed upon that everybody <laughs> knows is true that the CIA admitted to doing and the average person would be like, what are you talking about? That's mad. Um, so I, I like when I say these types of things, I try to, to speak plainly, clearly, and confidently and be like, no, no, it's this. It's, I try to be as simple as possible. Like, it's this, I can show you, um, I'll show you, you know, it's on Wikipedia and you can click on the links and then I'll take you to the, you know, the State Department website. It's all right there. Um, it is just simply true. Um, and to not, you know, I, yeah, again, I, I just try to be, like, I try to speak plainly and, and politely and be like, no, 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, not sort of present it as like, oh, I'm going to blow your mind because that, that can sort of, blow up um, in your face, just, it's just, just be confident, just know, know your history. And, you know, if somebody asks you what happened, tell them what happened, and, you know? Um, and um, yeah, that's, that's the best I can do. But I mean, again, it's a fight all the time. I mean, it's a fight all the time. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, you know, a lot of like mainstream liberal journalists that really are supposed to know this stuff, don't know it. And then you tell them they go, oh, and they, they're on their back foot because they have to like, check to see if it's really true. So yeah, again, it's another, it's another thing that's good, like constantly a battle forever, but that's how I deal with it. Yeah, thank you. Um, next we're gonna go uh, with Mike Goodman. Yeah, hello. Um, I had two brief uh, questions. First of all, what was the uh, foreign policy uh, orientation of the PKI? Were they oriented towards uh, Moscow or Beijing or some other a uh, socialist capital. My second question is, what was the status and what was the Indonesian attitude towards uh, Portuguese Timor during this early period when uh, Timor was still a Portuguese colony? Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad you asked both those questions, both things I could have uh, covered in a better version of my talk. Um, the PKI was an orthodox 
uh, Marxist Leninist party. So at every point um, after the success of the Soviet Union, they were allied with Moscow. And this included in 1956 when Khrushchev uh, denounced Stalin uh, and became what Mao thought was a revisionist. So the, the PKI officially technically um, ideologically was a Marxist Leninist party allied with Moscow, followed the line that Stalin uh, had committed crimes um, and never adopted a Maoism uh, as, uh, 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 um, as its approach. At the same time, it was always a supporter of Sukarno, always the loudest and most vocal and most um, enthusiastic supporter of Sukarno, who was all about non-alignment, who was all about um, um, being friendly with Washington and friendly with Beijing, um, sorry, friendly with Washington, friendly with Moscow, later friendly with Beijing, um, shifting more towards Moscow after the CIA invasion, but still always being about non-alignment. So in theory, Marxist Leninist, in practice, um, pro Sukarno, who was a third worldist. And then also in the later years, um, although they never rejected what Mao would have considered revis revisionism, they had a better relationship with China, uh, with Asian socialist parties in the final years before 1965. This is lar largely because after Bay of Pigs, um, Khrushchev didn't really want to mess around in, or so after the missile crisis, Khrushchev didn't want to be seen as provoking, being acting provocatively in the third world. Um, Brezhnev had no time for Sukarno's um, um, fight with Malaysia. So they were meeting often with Mao at the end, even though they were technically third worldists and even more technically Marxist Leninists that had fallen, followed the revisionist line after 1956. East Timor is um, very important and tragic uh, chapter in the story. So in 1965, uh, uh, East Timor was just Portugal. Um, but then after the Carnation Revolution in, 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 in Portugal, um, the people of East Timor got their independence. Now, inevitably, because it was 1975, some of the people that had fought to get the Portuguese to give up control had leftist rhetoric that, that were, were somehow um, using Marxist um, language. Again, everybody in the world was doing this. The Islamic revolution was doing this. The idea that you would have an anti-colonial movement that without some people um, being slightly Marxist would have been impossible in the seventies. So Suharto used this as a pretext to invade East Timor. And that, that invasion was perhaps more catastrophic than Pol Pot's government in Cambodia, about a third of the people of East Timor died. If you go there now, it's still absolutely torn apart by the, um, the Indonesian occupation and counterinsurgency operations. Um, of course, this was done with the backing of the United States and Australia. Um, they didn't have to do anything, but they gave them permission to do it. And by this point, the PKI wouldn't have, didn't exist at all. And it was because of Suharto's unquestioned um, and very important place in the constellation of US allies that he was allowed to do whatever he wanted and use this very flimsy anti-communist excuse once more to carry out uh, atrocities. Next we have RF. Is it the one that is, is oh, written here? Yeah, yeah, I think he wanted to, or he or she wanted to do the via text. Okay, I think I can know, yeah, here it is. So uh, silly, quest, question might be silly, but why was the CIA intervention different in Europe? I'm thinking of the years of lead in Italy. As I understand, they wanted, they wanted to defeat the communists. The economy was destroyed post-war, but the level of violence was significant. It wasn't at the mass murder level, level, but it seems like they could have gotten away with it. Now, this is a question that I put to some of the protagonists in the book, because one of the, the so probably the hero of the book, Francesca, moves to Holland. Um, after she's taken prisoner and her husband is killed. And what she realizes very quickly in Europe is that, oh, well, the United States is trying to suppress socialism here, but not in the same way. I mean, you're allowed to be in a communist party. You can win. You can be the mayor of a, of a, of a city in Italy or France and be in the communist party where everybody I know that was communist is now dead. I mean, her, her, her answer was very simple. She said, oh yeah, racism. You know, this is somebody that grew up under actual 
colonialism. She grew up in, in, in an apartheid um, society where she as a native did not have the same rights as the white people. And she made this connection very quickly that, oh, well, the United States is white too. They view the Europeans as their cousins. They give them, there's a different rules. Um, we're in the global South. Um, we're not treated with full humanity. Um, so while they're messing around in Europe to suppress the communists, as I said, the CIA funneling money, um, there's years of lead, there's Operation Gladio, which is very real, which is the, um, the network left um, in Europe to stop a possible Soviet invasion. What they really ended up doing was, was suppressing the left. Um, all of this absolutely happened, but it was different. Um, so that's one, I think that's one good explanation. I think another explanation is that at no point did anybody in Europe threaten to reshape the global economy in a way that would have hurt the United States. I mean, Western Europe was basically rebuilt um, along American lines. We forget now that uh, Italians and French centrists, even in the 50s and 60s, 40s and 50s, were complaining about the, the Americanization of their economies uh, th uh, via the Marshall Plan, but that did happen. So um, there was not, there was no leader that was saying we need to change the rules of the global economy um, that, would, that would have really sort of um, um, justify that kind of reaction. I think this is, a, not, it's not exactly the question, but this is, this is an important point to remember, I think. The United States government wasn't, they didn't, they didn't you know, you can imagine who these people were. Their, their first choice wasn't the mass murder, right? You know, if they could, you know, this is how you, you know, this is a smart imperial policy. If you can keep things in, 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 in shape, if you can keep your interests going with a little bit of tinkering with elections here, a little bit of suppression there, that's better than having to launch an invasion, which they did in Indonesia, you know, as, as wave two. That's better than mass murder. They didn't want to do it that way. So the fact that there was no real threat to anything in Western Europe, even, you know, Stalin and Khrushchev and Brezhnev often were instructing Western European communist parties not to make too much trouble because they didn't want to provoke the United States. There was just never really a, 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 a moment where they were terrified by the possibilities of what would happen if they didn't take action. I think that's, an, in addition to the racism, uh, that's, that's another explanation. Okay, um, next we are going to, we have Mia. Thanks, Ashley, and thanks, Vince. Um, I was wondering, and I know this was um, kind of covered a little bit in talking, through talking about Indonesia, but I was wondering, like, throughout the time you were doing the research uh, for the book and, you know, as all of the, as you were gathering the information, whether you can attribute or just talk a little bit more about why Indonesia in particular served as this uh, testing ground for U.S. foreign policy, because I feel like the CIA, CIA continued to fail in so many different missions uh, simultaneously in various countries, but kind of really persevered <laughs> in that country. And um, yeah, it seemed to obviously play a really central role and it's central to your book. So I was wondering if you could talk a little more about that. Yeah, that's a really good uh, question. One thing that I, I think I'll stress, and I didn't say this in the, in the talk itself, but every country was a testing ground, right? So like, one thing that the average sort of American know, thinks they know thinks they know about the Cold War is that there was an international communist conspiracy that the global left had forces everywhere and they acted as a global unit. Now this is true to some extent, but it was more true for the U.S. and its right-wing allies in the Cold War. So everything that happened that worked. They sort of wrote down and they said, okay, yeah, that worked. And they would use it somewhere else. And then maybe they would get better at it and then they would try it somewhere else. And then it would really not work there. So they'd realize, oh, we can't do it this type of place. So they, would, they, were, they were accumulating knowledge and expertise over, over uh, all of these interventions. And Iran, you know, I, don't want, I can't really go into the, the, exactly how, but you know, Iran worked in a certain way. Guatemala built upon that experience. Indonesia 1958 built upon that experience. Um, Brazil 1964 built upon all of the 50s and and like they just went back and forth learning what worked and what didn't. Um, and you mentioned the ways that they failed so often. I think this is again really important to understand. The CIA absolutely failed all the time, often hilariously, often pathetically, often tragically. But the thing about being the covert operations force of the most powerful nation that's ever existed is there's no referee to blow you blow a whistle and get you in trouble when you fail. 
like nothing, just nothing happens. Just literally nothing. Like not even like an article comes out in a newspaper that, you know, it, like nothing. So you just get another chance to try again. And when you try again, you try a new tactic. You try something that you heard from your South Korean anti-communist allies. You try something that um, someone, someone comes up with in the CIA and maybe that works. Um, and the thing about 1965 is not exactly that it was the testing ground. And it was, it was the place where this particular tactic that I focus, focus upon in my book um, was put into force mo most uh, horribly and on the largest scale and worked really, really well. As I, as I said, this was um, maybe the most important flip of a country from the independent-minded left-leaning forces, which there was a lot of in the middle of the 20th century to fully anti-communist American allied capitalism. And so um, I don't even know if they, you know, we still don't know. And I, I uh, somebody else mentioned this, but I like asked the CIA in my research, you know, like, cause you know, that's what you do in journalism. Even if you know, it's not going to work. You just called them and said, Hey, what did you do in the sixties? Can you declassify your files pertaining to your activities in Indonesia from 1960 to 1965? And they said, no, but, um, we still don't know if the employment of mass disappearances was planned or if it sort of emerged out of the situation. If, you know, we know that there was some planning, we know that the, the military had built the kind of organizational capacity that, that could be used in this way, but we don't know even if, if it was if it was the plan a year before or if it was a plan that emerged in the middle after they'd arrested people. So that's something that I really would like people to come away from, come away from this, from the book with, um, is that all of these things are connected. And it's not, they're not connected in a vague conspiratorial way. It's like literally the same people. They would finish one job here, then they would get a new job here. And then they would cable each other all the time talking about the best way to do these things. Um, and you can like very easily trace. It doesn't take a lot of like investigative uh, skills to be like, oh yeah, that person brought this thing here. Um, these people knew these people. Um, and so yeah, everything was a testing ground. Uh, and and, and um, when things didn't work, just nothing happened. You just ruin a country, kill a bunch of people, move on. Maybe come back to the same country a few years later, try something different. Okay, um, next we have NBP. Hi, thank you for coming on. Um, I was wondering if you could delve a bit into how Indonesians, either the rich, the elites, the poor, different parties now kind of relate to that time, the mass genocide, the genocide, the mass murder. Yeah, it's a very easy answer, question to answer. 100% of them don't talk about it. All right, it's illegal. The things that I said so far in this talk are illegal to say. Um, if you do anything which is vaguely center left or just seems to be threatening to the military, they'll accuse you of, a com of being a communist and then that will uh, inevitably whip up angry mobs, um, which could attack you or worse. Um, the election of Jokowi, um, a few years ago, I think it's 2013, I forget now. Um, very much an Obama figure in, in Indonesia. He even really looks like him. Um, was the first um, man elected outside of the military or ruling clique elite. Um, and some people thought that when he took power, he might apologize for what had happened or to open some kind of a truth commission or um, pay reparations even, he did the exact opposite. He, he made repeated uh, declarations that the Communist Party was never coming back and would be, need to be crushed if they did. And again, this is insane. There's, there's, there's nothing like a Communist Party, but this, this phantom is, is employed by whomever wants to tar their enemies uh, uh, until now. Um, uh, I, as an American, had sort of special privilege to do this in comparison to the many Indonesians that very heroically built up um, information and, 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 and have been working on all of this for decades. Because like 
for every single Indonesian, there can be real consequences to talking about this stuff. For me, I can, you know, I might be banned from Indonesia. I don't know. I haven't tried to go back since this book came out. But if I am, that's okay. I can leave. But for everyone that gets into this, there's some kind of a consequence, whether whether family or professional or worse. So, um, and there's no one that's like, there's no like party on the left that talks about it differently. No, it's 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 across the board. Okay. Um, next we have Melinda. Hi, I was just wondering how the book has been received in the mainstream, like in the West and maybe even among your employers, if you can talk about that. And if you can't, I understand. Yeah, no, uh, I was like, short answer surprisingly well, like basically no, basically literally no blowback. Um, I didn't expect, I mean, like a couple, like the New York Times and the Washington Post didn't review it. Like, but other like very, very mainstream um, papers or publications did and it's been all mostly positive. Like you got like named one of the best books by NPR and Financial Times. I expected like, I expected somebody to come out and be like, this is dangerous anti-American propaganda or something. It didn't. And I think, and then like, you know, the CIA itself or whatever, who knows? I mean, I'm sure they're very smart. I'm sure they, pay attention to what comes out. And I'm sure they also know that the best thing to do is just ignore or whatever, but very, I've been, I've been really, really lucky and grateful um, to have like, I guess, generous readers. Um, and in Indonesia, again, I'm, I haven't tried to go back. I think it's a bit dicey, it could go either way. But again, like somebody sent the other week, sent me a, um, a link from a conference at the Islamic University in Jakarta about the book and we were, uh-oh, uh, this is a, uh, a Catholic priest, uh, a really great man and a scholar named Baskara Wardaya who worked with me in um, Joe Jakarta. He's a Catholic priest that is, is really courageously working on this and being a priest helps him a little bit to be able to get away with it. And he texted me and said, uh-oh, this is gonna be bad. Uh, but it wasn't. The, the people at the Islamic University were like, oh, no, this is good. It's good to finally talk about this. So, so I've been really lucky and I'm really grateful for that. Um, but um, Knock on wood, I haven't like tried to fly into Indonesia because they could, the, the military can just like say, you know, you have no, you don't have a tourist visa ever again. Thanks. Um, next we have M. Thanks Vincent for the talk. Um, my question is with regard to regionally, um, what is the awareness of this history, um, both in the region and in kind of um, leftist factions kind of residual from the um, Afro-Asian conference in the in the 50s? So regionally in Southeast Asia, you know, there is like a new generation of Southeast Asian leftists, like I would say a, a lot, like I'm speaking of like a small Twitter community that I like um, interact with now. Um, but uh, like for a lot of some you know, in the Philippines, some some Indonesians, some Malaysians, but like it's like young, self motivated leftists that kind of know the story. If you like walk around Vietnam or the Philippines or Malaysia, like no one knows this. Um, it really like, but also it's that region is also different. You know, the region is so diverse, and each so some countries can can know little about others, even though they're so close. Um, it's really not known that much. It's really really the the the, the intentional. Um, project to bury this story was was really quite successful, and it's really alarming um, to 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 think about how that's even possible. But it was really quite successful. Um, Bandung is having like a renaissance, at least um, in certain corners of academia, and also in certain corners of the global south. People are re rediscovering and being inspired by this moment again. Um, again, it's like a young, um, energetic group of sort of progressives or liberals or leftists that are they're finding this but um it's like it's it's not gone it's still a real source of inspiration and, and in some ways it's a source of formal structures like the non-aligned movement technically still exists um there are still south south um organs of cooperation but though they don't have the sort of bite that they had back then yeah um next we have um max
No? Okay. Um, then we'll go to, I'm going to butcher this, Tulika Bose. Um, it's Tulika. It's great. Um, yeah, no worries. Um, so I have a question. Um, I am definitely a journalist that does not know <laughs> a lot. Um, can you tell me what parallels you saw in terms of maybe the British Empire um, or neocolonial powers that came before and kind of maybe what you saw the CIA using? Um, I'm just very, I'm curious about that. And then maybe if you've seen regimes sort of borrow these tactics afterwards. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, so this is an interesting dynamic. I talk a little bit about in the book, not that much, and then talk about it all tonight. The relationship between CIA and MI6 at the beginning of the Cold War was this weird thing where like the, the, the CIA was like the rich but stupid younger brothers and the MI6 and MI6 was like very smart and skilled, but they didn't have the cash that the Americans had. So there were like, and a lot of these, you know, I think the cultural history of the CIA really matters too. Like they all went to super elite Anglophile schools and then Yale and then joined, joined Yale secret societies. They were all guys that wanted to be English anyways. They grew up sort of in co like copycat um, New England um, lives, um, lives in New England that were like copycat versions of, of Eton College, of, of, the, of the backgrounds of, of MI6. So they had this weird inferiority complex where they really wanted to be like MI6 and they really looked up to them. Um, and MI6 looked down upon them as like well-funded idiots that could be made use of. Um, and in the very beginning, uh, like the first ever real big success, it was MI6 that was really pushing Americans to get involved. That's Iran 1953. Um, this was a, a, initially more of like a British imperial um, problem. Uh, and what you gradually see is them sort of passing the torch to the Americans, except for the regions where the British had um, sort of special power and influence. So like throughout the 50s, you see America taking over more and more, um, the British trying to hold on, but not being able to. Um, and then the United States getting the sort of confidence and experience to be as good at imperialism as the British were. Mm -hmm. So like one thing that I always bring up as like an example of like sort of baby stupid imperialism is that in both Korea, in both South Korea and South Vietnam, the United States insisted on installing a Christian leader, which like, if you're good at imperialism, you don't do, like, you know that it's going to be seen, it's going to be offensive. Like you got to get somebody, you got, you pay off somebody from the majority religion to pretend to be independent, but also to actually be your vassal. And as they got, you know, as things went along, they started taking over more and more space, started um, doing, um, um, what the British had done, getting better and better. But again, in Indonesia, 1965, the British were like, it wouldn't have happened without the British. Like it, um, it was to, to not an exclusive extent, but to a significant extent, the British uh, um, annoyance at Sukarno's fight with Malaysia that forced President Johnson to take a different tack than JFK. So if JFK was not killed, probably this wouldn't have happened like it did. But also um, MI6 and just Britain in general um, pressed Johnson to take a more forceful line against Sukarno in exchange for backing a war in Vietnam that everybody knew was stupid, but like, okay, I'll give, we'll give you Vietnam. You have to um, take our side on, um, on Malaysia, which meant anti-Sukarno action. So yeah, there's this kind of process where they go back and forth, they learn from each other, there's, they butt heads a little bit, America takes over more and more and more and more. Um, but that relationship of like the smart, but increasingly impoverished older brother versus the um, adolescent, well-funded, naive, but eager to learn um, younger brother, uh, I think, stays intact until now, kind of. 
Okay. Um, I just, I want to, we do have uh, several more people on stack, but we were aiming to finish maybe a bit past um, 8.30, but I want to check in with you, Doug. I mean, Vincent, how are you feeling on time? Um, it's two, it's 2.20 where mm -hmm. I am. Um, I'm, I'm okay to, you know, it depends if, if, if uh, I'm not, whatever you guys think is best. If I don't want to tell, you know, if you want to wrap it up, we can wrap it up at whatever, uh, eight 30, or I can keep answering questions until, you know, it's fine. Whatever. Well, no, I agree, Jeremy. Let's do, we're going to do three questions at a time so that you can kind of like pop them out, um, quicker. So let's do the first three. We're going to have Rob, Sean and Doug. So Rob. Hi, uh, thanks so much for this. This was awesome. Um, so you say somewhere in the book that in like chapter two or something that like, it wasn't clear with a lot of like the CIA boys, it wasn't clear if they were afraid of communism or if they were mainly acting in the service of like corporations. Like it's not clear ideologically which is taking up more space in their brain. And I'm kind of curious, like that seems really like strange to me. I'm kind of curious, like, what do you make of that kind of inability to tell, like, other than folks like, you know, Wisner, who's like, it's a lot more obvious, like, what do you make of that inability to tell what they're really kind of, you know, what's really driving them? I think this is really interesting. And I think this is like, you have to like, sort of get into like the philosophy of history to sort of think about how to talk about these things. Because everybody... I can't think. I can think of. I can't think of any uh, exceptions right now. Everybody that engages in concerted, long-term projects, a hundred percent finds a way to believe that they're doing something noble. So, you you can be acting objectively in the service of imperialism while believing that you're fighting communism, right? And, but again, I think it's important. To remember that in the case of these men, they believed that fighting communism and supporting American business were the same thing, kind of, right? So it all gets mixed together. And you kind of have to, you have to sort of listen to what they say about themselves and take it into account. But also as a historian or journalist, wherever you are, step back and be like, well, that part is like the rationalization for what's really going on. Like really their boss only cared about X. They just told themselves that it was Y. Um, but I think it was like, again, as I said earlier, like always both. So they believe they, they truly, so I talked to Frank Wisner's son. I went, he works at 30 Rock. He works like in 30 Rock. And um, it was really weird because I never been and like to take the elevator, it's like Seinfeld and stuff on the walls. It's like, oh yeah, like it's the same thing. Like this is the peak of like US hegemony, like CIA guy's son and like, you know, culture industry. Anyways. Um, he told me my father absolutely believed that he was fighting communism. And I believe that he believed that he was, you know, like, of course, right. But they saw these things as interconnected. Um, and concretely, the US government had to deliver certain outcomes to very important um, firms in the United States. And they could find a way to make that all kind of the same thing. Like, oh, we're fighting communism by helping United Fruit in Guatemala, um, you know, the fact that they want to mess with American business, which is self-evidently good for everybody and just the natural outgrowth of freedom is proof that they're communists. You see what I'm saying? Like you, you always find a way to, to, uh, to fill the brief, to do what is asked of you, looking at it the way you want to. Um, but you know, I think you can step back and say structurally, they were really going to do things when someone's material interests were 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 um, threatened, and all the like nice ideological stuff didn't actually matter. Like they didn't, you know, it, the stuff that was purely about like their view of freedom or whatever. No one was ever going to get mad at them if they didn't do that. However, if they didn't deliver results to the people that needed a military base in X country or to the company that um, really had uh, 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 the ear of makers they were going to hear about that um so it's, it's it's like it's complex to entangle that but um i think i think that's sort of what you have to do is to is to separate like what they said and what really they had to do and also understand that what they had to do 
informed what they told themselves about what they were doing. Okay. Um, for the second um, two questions, um, for the second two questions, let's ask them back to back and then Vincent can answer them. So Sean and then Doug. Yeah, um, so so first off, thanks for, for writing the book, Vincent. I found it really moving, really accessible. Wish we could make this required reading for every high schooler in the United States. My question is, um, wh what do you think is the contemporary significance of the vir virulent anti-communism that you detail in the book in the global South amidst this ongoing rise of China and growing US Sinophobia? And how does it factor into the US's current geopolitical strategy towards containing China? Okay, now Doug. I think, yeah, I got it. Hey, um, where we um, habitually uh, talk about, you know, the US did this, Washington's responsible for that, but Washington, the CIA, uh, couldn't have accomplished this, uh, these uh, decades of brutality without cooperation uh, and complicity coming from local elites. Uh, right-wing politicos, uh, the military, uh, local capitalists. So how do we um, allocate the responsibility uh, between these two forces, the locals and uh, the, uh, the, um, the guys playing the Wurlitzer in Washington? So yeah, those are the two to do one at a time, right? Yes. Right, yeah, okay. So first question, um, I, when this book came out, I was living in, I, was, I wasn't living, I was stuck in Bolsonaro's Brazil um, because when the pandemic hit, I was there at my old place um, doing some reporting for the second book that I'm working on now. And like in Brazil, that is like a really obvious, like hit you over the head example of the ways that um, this ideology of anti-communism like never went away. Can you ever, are you, uh, am I? You got me? Oh no. No, yeah, you're good. Yeah, you sound fine. Okay, great. Yeah, so really obvious um, example of the way that uh, like this murderous ideology of anti-communism could be drawn upon when needed by elites uh, around um, the world more subtly, just like the very nature of all regimes that were formed in the global South in the Cold War took their shape because of this moment in, in um, US hegemony. But this dynamic of being able to pick and choose that phantom to go to war for you again, I think is relevant to the China case because um, it really was convenient that China is, has communist in the name of the party that rules it because when uh, the United States decided to confront it again now recently that's just there you can draw upon it it's it's a well that everybody knows about in the united states um when you want to complain about real or imagined abuses committed by china you can use that that deep um um, um bag of sort of ideological tricks um and it, it it's useful it's useful um now doug's question is a really good one because this is a, this is a tough one and like you can really err, like you're almost always gonna err on one side or the other. Because I framed my book as a book about US hegemony, about the things that the US does, I probably erred on the side of privileging the um, agency of the hegemon rather than the local actors. You could also write the story of 1965 Indonesia with only a couple Americans in it, writing it entirely about Suharto's um, development uh, through the military, um, how the military understood this hegemon, knowing that the, the hegemon was setting the rules of the game, but that's about it. And then really just have it all be, because it's all really the Indonesians doing it. But the Indonesians do it because of their understanding of what the Americans will do if they do X. So like a over easy answer is just to say that everyone's responsible, everyone's has agency. But the way you sort of, the way that you sort of divide that as to who did what and who's really responsible does matter. And I like to think of the hegemons not as a player in the game, but as the referee 
who sets the rules. And if you think about a league of sports teams that play against each other, you know, <laughs> a bunch of matches that are played all the time, tipping the scales, even 3% towards certain types of teams could determine the outcome of every game, you know? You wouldn't have to, so like a 5% intervention everywhere could determine that 80% of the games go the way you want. So there's like this weird way where there's a multiplying effect when you're, when you're the hegemon, you're, you're um, active from outside. Because in the case of Indonesia, and some people like, like, like a sort of hyper positivist, like really that many CIA people in Indonesia at the time, which is absolutely true. Um, but what you had was a very, very deeply trained Indonesian military that was acting based on what they knew would get them the aid that they needed from the hegemon um, and what they, what they knew would happen if they did a certain thing. And then they got that, all they needed was that constant information loop saying, yeah, yeah, we want you to keep doing that. Then we'll give you all the aid. Then you will be able to join the community of nations. That's not like Americans doing it. It's Americans setting the rules and watching the consequences uh, unfold. Awesome. Um, as I just mentioned in the chat, these were actually our last two questions for tonight. Thank you everyone for all these amazing questions. Thank you, Vincent. We're gonna move on to announcements now. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Vincent. Again, um, great session. And um, so for announcements, first off, uh, as Vincent says, uh, caring about international Caring about U.S. foreign policy does not come naturally to um, Americans always, but that doesn't mean we have to stop trying. Um, and uh, to help you with that, DSA does have an international committee, which um, we encourage people to apply to join. Um, we're sort of uh, newly relaunched and uh, trying to do what we can to uh, further this mission. And you can reach out to me with any questions, reach out to um, the steering committee with any questions, and we'd be happy to help you um, I think Jeremy is posting links in the chat. Um, next up, uh, the Anti-War Working Group on Thursday, May 6th is, will um, host Stuart Schrader uh, along with the Racial Justice Working Group for teaching on policing in New York City, Kenya, Bangladesh, and Iran. Um, and there's contact information there for New York City Anti-War. Um, next up, we are all out for Mike Hollingsworth in NBK um, 10 weeks ago, and we would like to win this one. MBK phone banks for Michael Hollingsworth on Tuesday, uh, MBK canvas for Mike on Saturday, and the links again are in the chat. Um, last, Teamsters on strike, totally unjustified firing of 11 part-time low-wage essential workers, two are pregnant. Um, Thursday rally to come, stay tuned for updates, link is in the chat. Political education, next night's school session will be a mass incarceration with our own Julia Salazar, who is chair of the crime committee in New York State Senate. And, um, and there will be other guests as well. Um, this past Saturday, we all had a book club picnic uh, on the Jakarta methods. Um, and we expect to have a part two of that picnic. So stay tuned. Uh, we don't have the event up yet, but we expect to have it up soon. Um, we hope you'll join us. And then um, May Day is where we've held our events. Um, DSA in North Brooklyn has held events in May Day space. And during the pandemic, they are hurting. We are encouraging people to donate to uh, May Day, who's always really been there for us. We'd like to be there for them. And finally, we are North Brooklyn Political Ed. Uh, get in, you can get involved with um, this group if you'd like. Uh, Jeremy's posting our email in the chat. Um, likewise, if you're not a member of DSA, please consider joining. We can't. We need. We need everyone we can get. Um, also, if you'd like to uh, bump up your chapter dues, we can also use all the cash we can get. So. Um, that's it for announcements. Again, Vincent, you're such a dream to stay with us. I know it's like 2.30 in the morning your time. And um, if you want to, um, if we can do anything to amplify your message, do anything, uh, we, we would like to do that. Do you have a last comment or anything? No, no, I think just thank you again for having me. Uh, the paperback version of the book comes out, I think, in one week. 
I mean, it's fine. Like if you want to buy it or tell their friends to buy it, it's great or not. But I'm just really um, Fourth of July uh, grateful for for for. Huh? Yeah, sure. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm just really grateful for for anyone that's taken the time to engage with this work at all. I really didn't expect anyone to pay any attention, so I'm just thankful. Uh, you'll find me on Twitter if you want. I'm just talking shit all the time. Or uh, yeah, the books um, out in paperback soon. Amazing. Um, well, I think anyone, anyone, anyone I know who's read the book is telling everyone they know to read it. So <laughs> it really has made an impression on us. Um, so thank you so much for writing it. And good luck on your second book. What is it on? Or is it a secret? It is on the decade of mass protests around the world from 2010 to 2020. So the main narrative is Brazil, but it's, uh, it's about the sort of age of spontaneous mass uprisings and, and how it worked out. Amazing. All right. Well, good luck with that. And um, we will um, be eager to read that when it comes out. All right. Um, good night, everybody. Uh, again, come join us in two weeks. Um, join, join us for our next uh, book club and um, we will see you around. Um, and this uh, video will be is recorded and it will be on YouTube tonight or tomorrow on New York City DSA's YouTube channel. Thanks. Good night, everybody. <laughs>